Do you know, I'm not sure. I am not sure. I grew up in Liverpool when they were doing what was actually the first European Mahler cycle with the same orchestra and conductor. It is, you know, it's extraordinary to think of that. This was the middle of the 60s. But no one in Europe had played all the symphonies with the same conductor at this time. It had only been done in Utah by the Utah Symphony Orchestra. And you know, one forgets how off-center Mahler was at this time, before Bernstein, before etc, etc, etc. So I remember hearing all kinds of bits. And I remember that the, actually the tenth must have been one of the very first I heard. Of course, the thing that completely knocked me sideways when I was 11 or 12 was hearing the Second Symphony live. And that's the reason why I'm a conductor today. Who knows what love, in first, love at first sight is? Um, at slightly different times in my life, um, Mahler and Haydn both simply, they came to live with me. I mean, you know, whether that means you conduct it well or not, that's, a, that's another matter, that's not the same thing. But they came to live in my house. Uh, what, what, whatever it is, the, these, these were people for whom it, I felt I didn't need a translation. That really doesn't necessarily affect what comes out, but it does mean, it does mean a slightly different feeling. Uh, you know, it can be dangerous, maybe then you feel you have more license to kill. <laughs> uh, in, in their in their music, and I think it was a generational thing, also, with Mahler, because there was there was the feeling of new ground, being broken. First of all, you have to believe what he says, uh, and if you have an instinct for the music, particularly the scores he conducted. There is an extraordinary point where you think, my God, this feels, this feels good. Oh, I could move into larger beats now because it seems to be flowing. And at that point, you look at the score and he says, stay in four. And you think, I should move this on. And it, absolutely at that moment, he says, nicht eilen. He, is, he also knew his own instincts as a conductor because cause there, there was never probably before a great composer who was such a great conductor, maybe Wagner, we don't know, but that who conducted so many other people's music, who was so curious. I mean, when you just look at the programs he was playing in the last years in New York, Elgar, Debussy, Dandy, all these things, Rachmaninoff third with Rachmaninoff playing. He knew the dream of Garantius. He had the score. He had programmed Elgar's Second Symphony. In fact, even people, since he used the same cop copyist as Charles Ives, people think it's not out of the question. He knew, and of course, he would have been fascinated by, by all this. I mean, he was one of the most open-minded musicians there's ever been. First of all, believe him. Secondly, when you believe him, think what it means. I mean, a few, my great old mentor, Bertolt Goldschmidt, who was, of course, the first conductor of the Third Symphony in, in Britain and conducted the first performance of the completed Tenth. He um, was Kleiber's assistant for the first performance of Wozzeck in 25 in Berlin. He said so many interesting things to me. For instance, the fourth sentence, Simon, do, will you please remember what the phrase ohne hast means in a time where there were no automobiles? Oh, I think Mahler, I 
I think Mahler always did um, the Tenth Symphony even more so. Um, you hear, I mean, the first movement of the Tenth there is Lulu for you. The second movement of the Tenth there is Indemit. I mean, there's no doubt he would have gone in the last movement to God knows. I mean, Mahler was going in a completely other direction that even he hadn't gone in, and you know, strangely. A direction of a, of more simplicity. He would have. He was only fifty one. Why does music always take so long? Why did Weber walk out of the first performance of Beethoven Seventh, saying, "This man is ripe for the madhouse. He's no longer writing music." I mean, Weber. Some things take time. I'm very divided about that. Part of me feels that's a dangerously sentimental thing to say about the kind of catastrophes we had in the 20th century. But part of me also feels that it's impossible not to listen to the Resurrection Symphony without thinking, thinking of it as a prefiguration, whatever this, whatever this meant. All great composers have <sighs> such a degree of depth that we cannot help feeling that they are prophets as well. Whether this is true or not, who knows? But it's just, it's a sign of the importance we attach to the really great composers that we can't help feeling that they had some foreknowledge. There has to be. I mean, there really has to be. And also, for someone who was trying to write the whole world in his pieces, there has to be a connection. Uh, on the other hand, when you think of his schedule as a conductor, what he did in such a short time, I mean, nobody, you know, not even a crazy workaholic like Valery Gergiev could touch the, the sheer amount he was doing. And yet in the holiday times, he was able to write, he was able to write these things. Well, I have the feeling it must have been, as for Wordsworth, a kind of compulsion, because Wordsworth wrote his poems with very, very long uh, thought and then almost vomited them out. They were written so fast. And with Marlet, it must have been the same. Somehow it must have been cooking in these months he was, in these months he was working. You really think a Jewish person in this time had an option to be inside? It's very, na it's very naive of us if we think that. I think, of course, he embraced it. But I don't think he always had a choice. Well, who knows what the conversion to Catholicism actually meant? open verdict. Of course. And the, and, and the qualities of the Musikverein, in particular. Uh, the balances for his symphonies, the way he writes dynamics, are for the Musikverein, where the strings are louder than they are in other halls. And when, when you come here, you realize that immediately, but of course it's it, it's enormously it's enormously tied up with with that character of playing also, even if they hated it at the time. Uh, no, there's only one Mahler. 
he takes in everything. And the fact is that Mahler has an irony about himself. He said about the Third Symphony, you know, I know I've always had a addiction to triviality, but in this piece I've really gone too far. You might think you're in a barnyard or a tavern half the time. Uh, he had an irony about himself. And now, include everything. They are all part of the same. I think Mahler wanted life and creativity in its totality. Oh. I don't think he was a calculating musician or a calculating person. Strauss filled that corner very nicely and they were polar opposites. The story of Strauss going in after the first performance of the Sixth Symphony and say, but why is everybody looking so sad? It was a big success. And simply not understanding the import of the music shows you what you were talking about. I think Bruno Walter was the luckiest conductor who ever lived. my answer to that question because he just got to imbibe it straight there. Of course, I mean, but everybody's dream would have been to be there and take it in without asking questions. I mean, if you'd asked me that question 30 years ago, I would have told you 10 questions I would ask immediately. I'm a little bit older and wiser now, and I know that's, that's not how you gain knowledge. <laughs>